Good morning. Our call to worship this morning is Hebrews 4, verse 16, which says the following. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you here this morning. Our numbers are a little smaller. You will have to forgive the little things that may go wrong because I'm supposed to running, be running that thing, which I forgot already. But as we carry on, we will also know that uh, we are forgiven by God's grace, so therefore anything that we do wrong will be fine. Unfortunately, Lorraine will not be here with us to sign today. Um, the person she works with uh, phoned her this morning and said that she wasn't well, not sure if it's the flu or if it's COVID. So Lorraine and her wisdom decided to stay home. So therefore we will be doing without signing today. Um, next week, Gord Cox will be here as our guest speaker. Um, those of you who do not know Gord, Gord was uh, a member here for over 30 years. He now lives in Hanover and uh, he will be here to, uh, to bring us our message next week. This time I would like to lead you in our prayer of invocation. And near the end we will stop for a moment of silent personal prayer. Shall we pray? Father, this morning we boldly approach your throne of grace, knowing without a doubt you have in your grace and mercy covered all of our sins. Therefore, as redeemed members of your household, we come in humble gratitude to this place of worship and bow before you. It is fitting on this communion Sunday morning, in fact every morning, for us to joyously sing the refrain, May Jesus Christ be praised. We cannot say it often enough when we look at the price you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit paid for our free passage to heavenly glory. Father, to you belong all the glory. We thank you for the solid rock of our salvation which holds our anchors and gripply holds on to us. This morning, listen to our internal singing, and we thank you for the gifts that you have given Lorraine, even though she's not here today, and we hope and pray that she will be here with us next week to show us how to sign in a, another way to worship you. Father, we are thankful when we pray because we know heaven is always listening to hear our prayers of joy and sorrow. Hear now our individual silent prayers. Father, we ask a blessing on every aspect of this service. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Our first song is number 215, When Morning Gilds the Skies. Could you turn it up a wee bit out, please?
you to be seated, please. Notice the number of you got up and put your little envelope in that collection plate at the back. And at this time, I would like to pray for the offering. Father God, we come to you. We come to you because you and you alone are in control of this world. We come to you thanking you for the gifts that you have given us. We come to you thanking you for this time that we can spend together. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity of giving back to you. Lord, you have blessed this church in so many ways. We ask that you continue to bless each and every member that is here or that is not here. Give each of them what they stand in need of as we continue to bring honor and glory to you through our offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Responsive reading is Psalm 15, verses 1 through 5. Lord, who may dwell in your secret tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? One whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart. Whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor, and casts no slur on others. Who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory is our next song, number 56. To God be the glory. Ask you to stand as you are able. Thinking that maybe our service will not be online, 
I just wanted to let you know that Dan is at home recording the service as we are here. So uh, it's amazing what technology can do. This time I would like to lead you in our pastoral prayer. God of love, God of grace, God of mercy, God of peace, fill the sanctuary with your peace. For Father, we are made alive to be one. Bless Pastor Ted as he brings us this message. We are alive, living in the blessed assurance given to all who profess you as Lord of their lives. Lord Jesus, you who are the cornerstone who holds and joins all of us together, be with us this morning. Our closing hymn portrays this message as well. We are bound together in love with cords that cannot be broken. Jesus, keep us close to you as we walk down the roads of this land that is not our permanent home. Father, we acknowledge that we do not fully follow the words of our responsive reading. In your grace, forgive and cleanse us. Fill us with the Holy Spirit to guide and comfort us to follow you more closely. O oh Lord, in these times of great uncertainty, we tend to follow the world's way instead of looking into your word and there find the peace we so desperately look for. The peace that you are in control at all times, the peace we can only find at the foot of the cross, the forgiveness of sin and the promise that you will never let us be taken out of your hand. Father, with the prompting of the Holy Spirit, keep us praying for each other. This virus is very scary, but you are all powerful and already know the outcome. You are faithful to us as we stand on the, on the rock of ages and remain faithful to your holy word. We praise you with those in our church family. We pray for those in our church family and praise that, and with praise for those who are feeling better. Continue to heal those in need. Continue to comfort those mourning the loss of loved ones. The feeling of loss never goes away, but your love and grace keeps us looking forward to a time of no more tears, sorrow, or pain. We ask that you be with the doctors and nurses and first responders. Give them wisdom and safety as they work through these difficult times. We ask a blessing on Betty. Continue to improve her health. We ask the blessing on Annika. Make the cancer in her body be destroyed totally by the chemo she is receiving at this time. We ask that you be with Lorraine and the scare that she has got. We ask that you keep her safe. And Lord, we ask that you be with Shirley, with the news that she has received, that be with her and her family. Keep them close to you. May they hang on to you for the blessed assurance that all will be well with you in control. And Father, we ask that you bless any others in our church family in need of healing. We think of those in retirement and nursing homes. When we hear about the devastation in some of these homes, we thank and praise you for keeping our dear members and loved ones safe. We ask a blessing on all government and world leaders as they navigate through uncharted situations. Be with pastors and missionaries around the world to continue to bring the good news to so many. Be with Nancy this morning as she brings a message to the church in Sabo. Bless Dan and Shannon on their time away from the day-to-day -day work of this congregation. As a whole body of believers, as one in mind and focus, we bring glory and honor and praise to you, O Lord. We pray through the power of the Holy Spirit and in Jesus' precious name. Amen. It is our privilege this morning to have Ted as our pastor. I invite Ted to come forward. Um, I don't know if you, uh, we have the scripture on the screen, if you would like us to put that up. Sure. Okay. And people can follow along. Yep. Our uh, scripture this morning is uh, from... 
Uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Oh, and there it is. And uh, chapter 2. And we'll be reading the whole chapter this morning. Now, one of the interesting things about, uh, about reading the scripture is normally we don't read a chunk quite as big as this. But with Paul, it's very hard to know where to start and where to stop. The best thing you can do when you're reading one of Paul's letters is to read the whole thing. Because what he says is almost always built on what he's already said. Uh, that's the case today. We don't want to read the whole of the book of Ephesians. But I just want us to hear this chapter this morning because it all, we want to see how it all ties together today. So we read in chapter 2, verse 1, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming age he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Therefore, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcision by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, Remember that at, the, at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenant of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to those who were of you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord, and in him, you two are built together to become a dwelling which God lives by his spirit. May God bless this reading of his word this morning. It is interesting, the first time that I preached this sermon, it was back in April, uh, COVID had started. And in our church in Mount Forest, our pastor had uh, resigned and had moved on. And uh, we needed to fill in some preaching slots. So I was asked to preach this particular Sunday in April. This was after COVID had started. And we weren't meeting, just as you folks weren't meeting here, because 
The government said no gatherings larger than five, so we were not meeting, but we had adopted technology. And we were recording our service and then putting it online so our congregation could worship together. And it was a new experience for me because we were recording the sermon, we were recording the scripture reading, we had some music that we were using, and we would have a service for our congregation. So the day I was to record the message, this message, I sat in a room in our church in Mount Forest. It was the youth room. And I sat on a stool in front of a very nice uh, backdrop. And I delivered the message to an empty room. The only thing that was in the room with me was our uh, youth pastor's iPhone. And it was recording both audio and video. Never done that before. And when I saw the results the next Sunday, I thought, oh boy, I need to think about this if I ever have to do that again. So here I am doing it again, except now I'm with you folks. And for the first time, I'm preaching a sermon with one of these things on. And I want you to know I really don't like wearing these too much. And I don't know what today is going to be like. I do know that I was at work on Friday. I was delivering to a food service. I was on their dock, getting the order ready so that the receiver could check it. So I was doing my work, I had my mask on, and the dock was very cold. And I was working fairly hard, so I was breathing fairly heavily, and my breath was very moist, and it was very cold on the dock. And so my the moisture in my breath was condensing on the inside of my mask and, by the way, on the inside of my glasses. I could hardly see a thing when I came out of there. My mask was just dripping wet. I had to throw it out. It wasn't any good anymore. So it was a different experience. Like today will be a different experience. And so, as I said, as we look at this scripture this morning, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, it is a longer section of scripture. It is packed full of content, and it would be very easy to preach two or three or more sermons on this one chapter of Scripture. Now, I don't want to squeeze all of that into one message this morning, so I'm not going to do that. But we are going to have a little bit of an overview to see what Paul is saying to the church and to see how it applies to us today. So this morning, I want to ask you, to invite you, to cast your mind back to six months ago. So six months ago today would be the first Sunday in February. And our church service that first Sunday in February, if you think about your church service, if I think about what mine would have been like, it would have been very much like all of the church services we have had before. And at that time, our cares and concerns would have been focused on another typical Canadian winter. We would have been talking about the weather, probably complaining about how cold it was and how much snow there was on the ground. And we would talk about some of our winter health concerns, oh, I've, I've got the flu, or I've got a cold, or those sorts of things. Some of us may have been planning a uh, winter vacation to someplace warm. Lorraine and I were doing that. We had planned that at the end of March, beginning of April, we would be away to Myrtle Beach. And we would have been unfamiliar with words like COVID and pandemic. And if we wore a face covering, it would have been to protect our faces from the cold when we were outside shoveling the snow. And in the intervening months, so much has changed. For the protection of our greater communities and to discourage the spread of disease, we have changed the way we live. 
for a long time. Our interactions were limited to the people with whom we lived. Well, I can remember we went uh, months without seeing our son, who only lives an hour away from us in Kitchener. We didn't see him for months because he lived in a different household than we lived in. And as the curve has been flattened and public health restrictions are starting to be eased, we once again are able to meet for worship with some restrictions. But things are not the same as they were six months ago. We cannot shake hands. We cannot sing. We cannot share a cup of coffee and conversation after our service. We do wear our masks. We do clean our hands regularly. We practice a higher level of cleaning and sanitation in our public spaces. For the time being, we are not going back to the way things used to be. I am reminded of a nursery rhyme. It's the nursery rhyme Humpty Dumpty. And if you're familiar with Humpty Dumpty, it goes like this. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Now, Humpty Dumpty is often portrayed in popular literature as an anthropomorphic egg. Now, anthropomorphic means uh, something that takes on human characteristics, even though it's not human. An egg is not human. But Humpty Dumpty is portrayed as an egg that has arms and legs and a mouth and talks and walks and so on. And the image that Humpty Dumpty portrays is that of irreversible consequences. Once broken by a great fall, an egg cannot be put back together. You know what it's like in the kitchen. Once an uncooked egg is dropped on the floor, it is a mess to be cleaned up. It cannot be used for its intended purpose, say, to make a soft-boiled egg. You just cannot do it. And in fact, if you're saying, well, I can't use that as a soft-boiled egg, but maybe it might make scrambled eggs, um, I defy you, any of you to be able to say that you have got all the shell out of that egg before you serve it. And it seems to me that we are living in a time of irreversible consequences. In our world, the events surrounding the pandemic have changed the way we live and are not likely to go back to the way things were before. It seems, in many ways, to be an impossible situation. And when we despair, I want you to remember the promise of Scripture, for nothing is impossible with God. So as we sit here today and we wonder, when can we go back to normal? When can we share the gospel as we used to? When can we invite the children of our community to freely come in and hear the gospel? When can all of this happen? It doesn't seem possible. Remember that nothing is impossible with God. So in times like this, when our world has been shaken, it's important to remember our identity as a church. And Ephesians chapter 2 can help us focus on what the identity of our church is. We are made alive to be one. And that is the key idea I want you to take home with you today. We are made alive to be one. There are three sections in that second chapter of Ephesians. The first section is verses 1 to 10, and it deals with our salvation. The second section, verses 11 to 18, they deal with the unity of the church. And the last section, verses 19 to 22, actually deals with the church and some images pertaining to the church.
The first section describes our position as believers. It begins where we had began, what we were before Christ came into our lives. And it says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. This is a very stark statement. We are not just sinners. We are not just enemies of God. We were dead. Our bodies were alive, but we were spiritually dead. We were insensitive to God. We were incapable of doing anything about our predicament. Think of it for a moment. What can a dead person do? What good works or good deeds can a dead person do? The answer is nothing. We can do nothing about our predicament. We can't do any good in the world. We were dead. The cause of this death in our lives was our transgressions and sins. And it is both our act of rebellion against God and his ways and our sin nature, which is our natural bent, and it is caused by the fall. Romans 5, verse 12, put it this way, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and this way death came to all men, because all have sinned. No one can come before God and stand on his or her own merit and claim, on my own merit, I am good. We were all sinners, and because of our sin, we were dead. That's our predicament before Christ. But the story does not end there. Although we were dead in our sins, God has made us alive in Christ Jesus. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. Here is the wonder of the gospel. God saves his people because of his love, his mercy, and his grace. We have not earned God's salvation. We do not deserve God's salvation. God simply makes us alive in Christ Jesus. Our salvation does not depend on our good works. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 9 makes that quite clear. It says, not by works, so that no one can boast. So this means that as believers in Christ, we must have a humble attitude. Our abilities and efforts gain us no favor on God. We are dependent completely upon him. Once we were dead in our sins and transgressions, but now we have been made alive in Christ. That is our position as believers. Up to this point, even though Paul was using the plural you in speaking to the believers in Ephesus, it's possible to interpret this first section of chapter 2 in an individualistic manner. We come to faith in Christ and receive the gift of God as individuals. The teaching of Scripture ended at this point. Oh, now I lost my spot. Okay, there we go. If the teaching of Scripture ended right here with this lesson that we are saved by grace, it is possible that we would go out and live for Christ as individuals. But immediately, as we move into the second part of Ephesians, we see that as Christians we are called not to life as individual believers, but we are called to life together with other believers. It's put this way, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. So in the early church, there was this dividing wall, and it took this form for them. The church began on the very first day of Pentecost. You can read about this in the book of Acts. 
And it was largely a Jewish church. The church began in a Jewish city, the city of Jerusalem. The first leaders of the church were Jewish. The men who wrote the scriptures, the New Testament scriptures for us, were mostly Jews. The people, the first people who heard and responded to the gospel message were, for the most part, Jews. And as the church began to reach out into other areas than Jerusalem and the surrounding area, other peoples also began to hear. And they responded to the gospel. So there were two groups of people in the church. Jewish believers, and as the scripture says, sometimes they were called the circumcision, and non-Jewish believers, or Gentiles, who were sometimes called the uncircumcision. And at the time, there was tensions between these two groups of people. And steps had to be taken to keep the church from falling apart. And Paul reminds the believers in Ephesus, who were mostly Gentiles, that in the previous life, in their previous life, they were cut off from God completely. They had no part of God's blessing. They had no part of God's fellowship. They had no far part of the life that was available to all those who followed Christ. But now, because of the work of Jesus done on the cross, they had been made one with all who believe. There may have been Jewish believers and Gentile believers, but they were all made alive in Christ. And they became part of the one church that Jesus is building. We may not have the problem of Jewish and Gentile believers in our church, but we still have divisions. And our divisions within the modern church still have that potential to tear the church apart. And we need to remember as God's people, that God is calling all kinds of people to himself. And his goal is not to make us hyphenated believers. By hyphenated, I mean um, some description of ourselves and then Christian. So if I say I am a Canadian Christian or whatever, whatever that we put in that hyphenation, he doesn't want small groups of believers that reflect a distinct ethnic, social, or economic background. And that's just a limited list of the things that can divide us. And I'm sure you could think of other characteristics that can divide God's people. God wants to make us one in Christ Jesus. He wants to bring us together on the basis of being cleansed of our sins and made alive in Christ and made one in the church. The last section of Ephesians 2 focuses on the church, and I want you to listen again. These are um, important words, and I, and I can't tell you how many years ago, because this is a relatively old Bible, but many years ago I highlighted these verses, and I want us to hear them again. Ephesians 2, 19-22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people, members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. Now, there's many descriptions of the churches, of the church, in these few words. And each one of them carries some idea of what it means to be the church. So the first one that I noticed is we are fellow citizens with God's people. And you know that being a citizen carries certain rights that non-citizens do not have. When the uh, COVID-19 pandemic was breaking out and things were changing rather rapidly and almost daily, uh, various leaders were standing up and making new announcements. 
One of the things that happened was that international borders began to close. And the Canadian border was closed, and it remains closed to at least some people still to this day. But as that international, as the Canadian border was being shut, guess what? Canadian citizens were still allowed to come home. So if you arrived at the Canadian border, either at one of our airports, or one of the land borders, or the seaport, if you arrived and wanted to gain entry into Canada, and you were a Canadian citizen, the border guards could not keep you out. They may say you had to quarantine for a period of time, but they would not keep you out and refuse you entry. We were allowed to enter as Canadians. So, being made alive in Christ means that we are fellow citizens with God's people. We have certain rights and responsibilities that being a citizen entails. The second thing we can notice about the church is that we are, have been made members of God's household or of God's family. And we often talk about the idea of the church being family. We are God's children, adopted members of God's family. In Romans chapter 8, there are these words, The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we eagerly await our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So there should be a closeness amongst God's people because we have been made in Christ members of the same family. The last three images of the church relate together in this particular section as they deal with the idea of the church being a building built for the glory of God. We are God's building, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Jesus as the cornerstone. We are a holy temple for the Lord. And we are a dwelling where God lives by His Spirit. Now this is not a literal building like a place where we meet for worship on a regular basis. The interesting thing is that we actually do not need a church building to be the church. It is just a place and a tool that can facilitate the ministry and the work of the church. If it were to disappear in the blink of an eye, we would still be the church the building of God, the temple of the Lord, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. The glory of God is not revealed in a piece of architecture, no matter how spectacular it may appear, but the glory of God is revealed in his people, whom he is building into his church. We are made alive as the church to be built for God's glory. Our identity as the church is this. We were dead in our transgressions and sins, but God has made us alive in Christ Jesus, even when we were dead. In making us alive, God to his glory is working to make us one in his church. God's work in our lives and the church is still ongoing. May our prayer be the prayer that Paul expresses in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 to 6, when he says about the Philippians, but he also says about us, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from that first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until that day of Christ Jesus. We are going to gather 
and celebrate that unity that we have in Christ as we gather at the Lord's table. And uh, as we gather, I want us to join uh, to sing a hymn, uh, number 577 in times like these. God invites us to demonstrate that we indeed are one, one in Christ Jesus. And I want us, as we gather at this table, to hear what God says to us in his word. God's scripture is the basis for all that we say and do. And so I want us to hear a portion of scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Pastor Shannon made reference to this last week, actually. And it says in chapter 11, verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whether you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I did neglect for a moment to ask if everyone has their communion preparation ready. If there isn't, there is isn't. some more at the back. So it is our privilege to come and to share the bread and to share the cup that remind us of what Jesus has done for us. And I'm going to ask Bob if he will give thanks for the bread this morning. says in the scripture that when Jesus was serving the meal, he took bread and he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us also eat the bread in remembrance that Christ's body was given for us. Again, the scripture reminds us that Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. I'm going to ask the to if would give thanks for the cup this morning. As we come this morning back to the table, to remember that God sent his holy son to sacrifice his life for all salvation, we have to remember that his blood was not given for nothing, it was for all salvation. That we may remember that every time that we come to this table, he has forgiven our sins, and that we have been very thankful for that to give us eternal life. We ask him, when we drink this cup, that his blessing may be upon us. And we ask that in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Again, we are reminded that Jesus took the cup and shared it with his disciples, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord's Supper. At the end of the time they had together, one of the Gospels shares that they sang a hymn and then they went out. So we too want to join together and sing. We're going to at least sing in our hearts until that time when we can once again sing as the church. We want to sing in our hearts, bind us together, Lord. Please stand if you're able.
day. But we are grateful that you have called us to be your people. You make us one in Christ Jesus. So we pray in the words of the hymn, bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. And as we go, may we hear the blessing of Scripture that says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all.